Hi, this is Chapter 12, Communication, Apprehension, and Delivery. We're going to look at why you should care about delivery skills, how to reduce your fears of public speaking. We're going to look at four modes of delivery of public speaking. We're going to look at your vocal aspects of presentation, the bodily aspects of presentation. It's kind of hard to do over the video when I'm not showing you my body. I'm going to demonstrate that in class, but we're going to talk about it. And delivery tips for non-native speakers. Now, that when I get to it, you need to understand that you may be a native English speaker, but other people who are not native speakers will encounter the challenges that we're going to talk about. So we'll keep an open mind on that in a little bit. So why care about delivery skills? Well, there's three reasons. First of all, what is delivery? What is communication apprehension? And experiencing communication apprehension. These are three big areas of this. So what is delivery? Delivery is how your voice and body affect the meaning of your presentation. Now, you might sense that I'm stressing my words, so maybe I'm clenching my fists, leaning forward just a little bit, squinching up my face, making shoulder motions, just really making different postures. And again, it's you can hear it, but you can't see it. But sometimes you can understand. So if I'm just sitting here with my hands at my desk, talking monotone, you kind of get the feeling that, yeah, I'm bored and I'm monotone, maybe hunched over a little bit. But if I'm excited, you can really feel it. And you know what? When you see it, it's much more amplified than when you're just hearing it. So we need to be very careful about this. So effective delivery contributes to the credibility of the speaker too. So if you stand up straight, put your shoulders back, look people in the eye, hold your head up straight, people are going to feel automatically that you actually are confident, that you really are into what you're doing versus if you slouch over you put your head down you make little eye contact and you fidget and maybe you're a little nervous or maybe you, you kind of peek up a little bit from reading your notes and talking monotone and your face is kind of dull and boring and you don't smile well the credibility is going to change now here's the problem I can tell you all day long, and you agree with me, that you shouldn't move around, that you shouldn't make good eye contact, that your voice should be animated, and you should use different pitches and tones of your voice, and different speeds, and your face should smile, and you get up there and all of a sudden you turn into the robot. <laughs> These things happen, and you know what, we're going to laugh with you, and afterwards you're going to be like, I thought I was smiling, and it really takes some practice. And you have to feel it. That's why we need to do these skills, especially in today's world when we're on the cell phone texting. Nobody's seeing our face. We're not practicing the outward going emotions and the movements that need to happen to make us even more credible. So communication apprehension. We could call this a fear. We could call this different nuances, little, little twicks, twerks, whatever you want to call them of your fingers. Some people twiddle their thumbs, pick on their nails. Girls, long, a lot of times they'll play with their hair and pull on a strand when they get nervous. Guys might scratch their face or chin or ears or their head, depending where our bodies get a little scratchy and itchy from sweat breaking out and from adrenaline going up. So you need to feel this stuff and then realize that you're doing it and then how to overcome that. That takes practice and patience with that. So there's two types of apprehension. One is trait apprehension. This is communication apprehension that occurs in all kinds of different circumstances, or as the author uses it, in a variety of circumstances. And you don't always know when it's going to happen. It may happen suddenly. It may happen because you have a lapse of concentration or you're tired, you haven't eaten, you don't feel good. Something's not right, and it may happen there. State apprehension happens only in certain setting. Say in front of your class, you're fine, you're calm. And all of a sudden you go to speak in front of your family and you are terrified. I mean, you are absolutely freaking out and you want to run out of the room. Well, sometimes families intimidate us more than strangers. And sometimes it's a reverse. Talking in front of your family is a very natural thing to do. But in front of more than three people, you absolutely freak out and want to melt. Or maybe it's in front of 5,000 people, you're really comfortable, but in front of 30, you're not so comfortable. It depends. It could be on the building. If we took our class and moved it into a really large auditorium and just set up eight chairs in front of a podium, you might freak out at that because it's the environment that you're in versus putting us in this little closet or a hallway talking where it might be more comfortable. Or maybe it's the opposite. We don't know. But again, to feel these things, be aware of how you react, not just what's in your head, but 
how your physical stature, your body is reacting to this stuff. The more you're aware of that, the easier it is to start making changes to overcome those fears. Experiencing communication, apprehension is some other things. We're often our own worst critics, and you may have heard that. If you're a perfectionist, if you're somebody who just can't accept anything but perfect, you're going to be pretty tough on yourself. And that's one reason we do the self-critique and the informative speech and not the others. When you can start rationalizing and analyzing what you're doing versus what you're thinking versus what you're seeing, it really helps put the pieces together of, it really wasn't that bad or, oh, wow, I didn't know I did that. So we want to learn about these things. They really can make a big difference. Sometimes people are very hyper when they talk in front of people. Other times they're a little bit too chill, too relaxed. So depending on your presentation and what it is, sometimes relaxing is good, but you don't want to get to the point where you're just kind of, wow, I'm just chill. You know, it's okay. Well, <laughs> you want to find a happy medium. Okay. Think of the Goldilocks effect. Too hot, too cold, just right. You want to be just right. And it's going to change depending on the topic depending on your audience and depending on you and the message that you're trying to get across to people. Quick chart. And again, this was done in 2014. I have a feeling some of these numbers are going to change over time only because the increased usage of texting and Facebook and Snapchatting, where we're not actually live face to face with people. But the top fears of college students, and again, this is probably done in 2014 by the author. Oh, actually, it was 2012. Sorry. I didn't look down at my reference because you have to mention those out loud, remember. Uh, you can see the pink is women and men are stereotyped. How <laughs> stereotyped that is, but men are blue. So speaking before a group, women are more apprehensive than men. And these are pretty high numbers. And even when I was younger, and we'll talk 30, 40 years ago, public speaking was still people's number one fear. And they fear it more than financial problems. Now, I kind of fear financial problems. I'm not afraid to speak in front of people. But again, it depends who you are and where you're at in life and what you've experienced. People are not as afraid of death as they are of financial problems or speaking in front of group, groups. And we're not so much, or the people that they interviewed and surveyed, were not that much worried about loneliness as compared to speaking before a group. So again, these aren't the rule. These aren't the law. This is just a study that was done. And again, we don't know how big of a study it was, what college it was at, what group of people. Again, if you are afraid of speaking in front of people, that's your fear. And that's understandable. If you're afraid of being lonely and that's more a problem, then that's yours. So again, take these surveys in stride and be careful. Don't put all your eggs in one basket or don't count on them 100% as being accurately true. This is just a quick survey, just a, a little microcosm of the universe. How to reduce your fears of public speaking. There's a few ways, and I like these. Systematic desensitization. This is one where you progressively learn to overcome things. You progressively learn to relax, to visualize, and actively engage in exercises that the author child loves these three-step processes, and I really like these. So when you're coming into your speech into the environment and you're about to give that speech, your armpits are a little sweaty. I mean, like this guy, he's already sweating up here and it could be 95 degrees up there. We don't know his armpits. He's got that little bit of, you know, that perspiration going. As they say, never let him see a sweat and you'll seem that more confident. And it's kind of true, but you know what? If it happens, it happens. So here's what we have to do. Arrive a little bit early and show up completely relaxed. In other words, don't have three Red Bulls, Monsters, 12 cups of coffee, tea. Reduce your caffeine and be careful of chocolate too. Chocolate has more caffeine than you realize. And it also, the sugars can mess up your vocal cords, which then you'll get that scratchy thing and you'll, <clears throat> so be careful of sugars. Um, no donuts, sweet stuff, avoid that stuff one to two hours before and then cut it off. Okay. Don't do anything close to it because that's going to increase your anxiety and your tension and you want to come in relaxed. After that, imagine yourself doing a small part of your speech effectively, not just doing it, but this is an effective part of my speech and here it is. So I'm going to tell you my introduction and you do this in your head. Maybe you do it in your car before you come into the building or maybe you go find a classroom and just say it out loud. Don't do it in your head. And here's why. If we keep quiet and it doesn't emanate from our lips and comes out as noise and it stays silent, it's different 
Because when our thoughts are not the same as our words. Because maybe you're thinking of the word statistics that always, uh-oh, statistics. Oh, no, I can't say it. Statis, stat, stat, statis, math. Okay, so now you have a problem. You know there's a word that you trip over. Practice it. Stay. <coughs> Excuse me, because now I'm choking on the chocolate, but I didn't have any. It was coffee. Excuse me. So <laughs> I'm laughing on this because I've seen this a lot, and I've been through this training quite a bit. Statistics is a word that trips me up personally. It's just one of those words that I practice. So even before I know I'm going to say statistics, I always think of statistics as a joke. But now I have to be careful because of the joke is turning into reality. So again, I have to practice before I say it. Finally, you're going to engage in activities that are slightly more anxiety producing, such as delivering the introduction to yourself in a mirror. It could be your car mirror, your bathroom mirror, wherever you have mirrors at home, somewhere even in the bathroom at school beforehand. Then go deliver your speech in front of a friend and then your family, people you trust who are not going to judge you. They may laugh a little bit or, you know, say, hey, make faces at me and get me used to this stuff. Do something different, but with other people too. In this way, your desensitization to that stress and that fear should go down over time. Now, there's some other techniques that if you're really terrified, I can help you through. And I've done this with a few students that I've actually had truly terrified of speaking in front of people. And we've gotten them through it pretty easy. Cognitive, cognitive restructuring. See, I'm already thinking of all the errors I like to say. Cognitive restructuring aims to reduce our public speaking anxiety by using four steps. And the first one is create a negative self-talk list. So if you always say, oh, I'm so stupid, I'm so dumb, I'm an idiot, and blah, 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 make that list. Write it down, okay? Don't just keep it in your head. Get it on paper and then look at it. Then analyze each one of those statements and say, why am I saying that? You're not stupid. You're not dumb. You're not an idiot. Yeah, maybe you made some mistakes or maybe your your voice isn't right or maybe your posture is not right. But say, oh, you know what? Stand up straight or somebody's going to think you're weak. You know, write that down. Anything negative, get it down on paper and analyze it and develop a coping statement of how to overcome that. Oh, I'm so stupid when I like, take tests. Okay. I feel that way too when I do bad on a test. I don't like tests. So I got a, a, a C. Wow. Well, why did I get a C? I'm not stupid. I just, oh, I know. I didn't study correctly. Now, it's not studying hard enough. I just didn't study correctly. In other words, I read through the chapters once. I didn't do study guide. I didn't review it. I didn't do the practice exam that was online. Oh, okay. So it's not me. It's my procedure. Mm, okay. So we can start to overcome that, which means I'm developing a practice, a routine to overcome those statements. So you can see here, my fear is forgetting or messing up on my words. Then my fear is that people won't want to hear or won't care about what I have to say. These are very common, by the way. And my fear is that people will notice my nervousness. All right, so now overcome those. My fear is forgetting or messing up on my words. So what? Move on. Make the mistake and keep going. No problem. Practice. If you have that problem word, statistics, <laughs> statistics, Practice over and over and over again. My fear is that people won't want to hear or won't care about what I have to say. So what? Don't worry about that. Of course they want to hear it because you want to tell it. Pretty simple, right? It's don't pre-think and pre-judge what people are going to think of your topic. Let it out there and then see what happens because they might love it more than you even thought they would. My fear is that people will notice my nervousness. Yes, we will. So what? get over it, move on. Now, that's easy to say, move on. But you know what? Through practice, you will get better. And when you watch your video, that nervousness that may actually be seen in your head may not be visible to other people. And when you watch yourself, you may go, wow, you know what? I was a nervous wreck, but it really didn't show. Now, if you're fidgeting with your fingers, playing with your hair, doing like call the hip sway back and forth and shifting weight and guys go forward, girls go side to side. Yeah, that we're going to notice. But once you're aware of it, you get to start stopping it. When we're analyzing these things, again, we just kind of talked about that, but just read through this. Just identify any unrealistic or overly negative assumptions being made about yourself. Okay. Really figure out what it is that you're perceiving versus what's real. That's one way to get through that. The third step is to develop those coping statements to balance out that negative self-talk when it does occur. Now, 
if self-talk occurs while you're giving that speech, it's going to show up in fumbling over words, losing your place, making faces, the um, um, or the two seconds of silence. So again, that takes practice. And again, if it happens, it happens. You know, we'll get through it. It's not a bad thing. It's just something you're going to work on to get rid of in the future. The fourth thing is, again, practice those coping statements. You got to retrain your brain. It's just like going to school. If you haven't gone to school or college in a while, or if you just started, it's not high school. It's not middle school. It's college. It's not that it's this or that. It is just that. Okay. And you overcome it. You just deal with it. Now, skills training. This takes some time. Once we identify some of your problems, some of your challenges, some of your issues, some of your nuances, some of the things that maybe you want to change that, well, I'll catch everything too. I'm pretty good at this, but we can work together on this. You could say, I want to stop doing this. What can I do to improve on that? Let me know what it is. I will find you something. I will coach you through that. And it's not that difficult, okay? Unless it's something really severe. Um, if you have a stutter when you're nervous, that's something that's going to take time and patience and a lot of practice and a lot of work in front of people. I've had students with stutters, not too severe, but there's ways of overcoming that. And yeah, it does take some work, okay? The four modes of delivery, the extemporaneous mode, the impromptu mode, the manuscript mode, and the memorized mode. The extemporaneous mode is what we're shooting for in this class. This is when you prepare, you practice, and then you deliver in a conversational way without your notes, if possible. Now, they say heavy dependence on notes, and I agree with that. If you read word for word for word, because you just absolutely can't do it any other way, we're, I'm going to let you do that. I would prefer strongly, and I'm going to advocate that you don't do that. The reason is you're going to become very dependent on those notes, and your next speech will be the same way. We want you to wean yourself. In other words, try to get away from those notes. Use them as a guideline. And remember that magic finger I showed you about, your little index finger? Use that because you will lose your place in this. These are, this, I'm doing an extemporaneous mode right now, making mistakes. It happens. You know, I've done this I, uh, two dozen times. I've gone through these chapters live on top of triple that, looking at them. I always review them before each class, each week. So I kind of remember what's coming up just to make sure that I'm kind of right in my head's in the right zone on this thing because I don't want to go off on a tangent on something else and go, oh, that's not what we're talking about. So extemporaneous is, I'm practiced, I'm prepared, and yeah, I'm kind of cheating. I'm looking at the notes, but it's conversational notes. Even if I read it, it still can come off that way as well practiced and conversational. The impromptu mode is, hey, here's a speech. You got 10 minutes, get ready to give it and go up front and do it. So impromptu is very quick. You may not have any notes. You might not even have a plan. There may be somebody else's PowerPoint and I'm gonna say, hey, you up front now teach the class this. And if you're going into education, you might be challenged with that. And you know what? Thinking on your feet is good practice to overcoming fear. There's no time for fear. Okay. This is a really good thing for some people. The more we prepare, sometimes you become more nervous because now you think, oh my gosh, what if I make the mistake that I've been making while I practice? Well, overcome that. Practice, 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 or just wing it. Okay. Think on your feet. The manuscript mode, this is what you're going to see on TV. This is when some horrible crisis, some event happens and the police chief or the sheriff or the mayor or the governor or the president gets up there and reads word for word for word for word without a change. This is where a speechwriter puts something up on the screen and the person reads it. Usually in a very stressful situation, in a very legal manner, sometimes where there can be no errors. The manuscript mode is what's read. You can tell when people are going off the manuscript because all of a sudden their eyes change, their posture changes. Watch the chin. If the chin goes up or down, things can change. If the eye contact is looking at about a 30 to 45 degree angle to the camera and the head goes back and forth specifically, that's manuscript mode. They're reading off these teleprompters that they have. When people start looking into the camera, newscasters, they may be reading manuscript they're really good at it. So sometimes it comes off conversational, but the more live events, again, we just had an incident over the weekend 
where they're reading manuscript modes because it's so stressful and so emotional that there's no other way to do it. And, and it's one way for people to survive that moment in time too. And that's a very important thing to know. Sometimes you just read what it says and then you say thank you and you move on. The memorize mode is great if you're good at it. If you're not good at it, it's not good. Memorize modes also can be very damaging because if you do make a mistake and you do lose your place because your brain gets in the way and go, oh my gosh, I wasn't supposed to say it that way. It was, oh wait, what's next? It's going to look bad. Now in a competition, memorized mode works good. In theater, choir, memorized mode works good. If you have a one minute to two minute speech window and it has to be perfect and you don't have notes or you don't want to be embarrassed by shuffling papers, memorized mode works really good too. It may be that you're doing something for a religion, for a government, for school. Again, memorized modes can work good, but the error level can really mess things up. So you have to be careful to memorize modes. I've had a few speeches do, or a few students do memorized speeches. Amazing, absolutely amazing, but they're gifted for that too. When you can go five minutes memory, that's awesome. I don't, I doubt I can do that. I used to do some theater and five minutes is a long time to memorize word for word for word for word. Vocal aspects. These are my favorite things. Now, because we're on the radio here on WALT radio, you'll have to figure that one out. I get to have some fun with this. So vocal aspects. Projection is speaking loudly enough for all of you to hear. Now, if I was in the classroom, I would increase the volume of my voice. So my projection would go out. Now, if I turn my head away from my microphone, I've got a pretty good mic. So I'm not quite sure how this sounds, but I have my back to the microphone. You're going to notice a big difference than if I pivot around and direct my voice back towards my microphone. Now I've got, again, it's a really good microphone, but you probably were able to tell a little bit of difference. Now, volume. If I drop my voice and I lean into my microphone, you could kind of drop my voice. Now, I'm not going to yell, but if I yelled from here, you would probably drop your phone, <laughs> pull out your headset, and be like, why did you do that to me? So I won't do that. But when I can sit back, I can raise my voice, and it shouldn't hurt your ears. But this is really good to do to draw your audience in, you drop your voice, and then you increase your voice to really gain their attention. Now, when it's live, this is much more effective. The rate of speaking. Now, some people like to be very methodical by stretching out their speech into a slow manner because they know they're going to talk really, really fast. And if you're talking really fast, sometimes it's really hard to understand. But some people can talk so fast. It's amazing. The average person talks about 125 to 190 words per minute. I don't know how fast I'm talking right now. I actually had a student do this. She fit a 15-minute speech into five minutes flat. And we are talking. It was amazing. There was no um or, or anything. There was no two-second breaks. She didn't stutter. And she just blasted through it. And she goes, how was I on time? Was I over? I'm like, no, you were pretty much on time. <laughs> so again, practice your rate. Get your phone out. Practice. Get your stopwatch going. See how many words you get through in a minute. Take a printed sheet of paper that's about 200, 225 to 230 words. Read it. How long does it take? Do the math on this stuff. This way you know exactly how long it takes to go. Now, pauses. These are things that, oh, they're my little nuances. You might have noticed that already. They're the um, the uh, likes, ah. Uh. We all say it's kind of like this. It's kind of like that. They're similes. Well, it's kind of like, you know, okay, that's not a simile. That's bad. Well, it's kind of like this and it's kind of like that. Those are bad. Okay. The vocalized pauses are bad. These disfluencies, these pauses are something that you do need to practice to get rid of. If I can actually get through a video without saying any of these four things, it'll be pretty amazing. And you'll know the difference when I do it. Today, it's a little, it's early in the morning and I'm doing this and not quite as awake as I usually am. I haven't moved around as much. My brain's not fully functional yet. So some of these may pop out just because, well, maybe my eyes are still blurry and it's very dark actually. So some of these may actually happen. But when I know I'm going to go, I'm not going to say the word, even though there might be a little break in between, it keeps going. So again, you got to practice these things. Fluency is the smoothness of the delivery, the flow of how the words come out of your mouth, how your lips 
get it. Sometimes if we get that cotton mouth, that little stuff on the edge of your lips, it might squeeze your lips together. It can really mess things up. You want to lick your lips. You have the urge not to because you think, oh my gosh, everybody's seen me do it. Sometimes you just have to do it. It's a normal thing to do. And if you become dry and dehydrated or nervous or over caffeinated, these things are going to happen. So fluency is a big thing to work on. The pitch of the voice is really important too. It's not throwing a ball. It's how high or how low we go. Now, some people have a neutral voice. They're, they're in this perfect band where it's easy to listen to. Some people have a really irritating voice and they talk way up here. And some people have a way down here voice where it's that super FM voice. And some people just go in between and others have that monotone robot voice. Again, where's your pitch at? Record yourself and listen to it. If you don't like it, change it. Now, our voices are our voices. You can train yourself to modify and adapt your voice for different situations. Really high voices and that pitchy voice and the, the inflections and all that, it, little nuances, some audiences ignore it, some drives them crazy. And again, it depends who your audience is. Pronunciation is something important. Pronunciation is the act of correctly articulating words without over articulating your words. So practice these. Now there are words again, like statistics that I know is my problem. Practice them. Okay. Urdu, Urdu, Urdu. Hmm. It's official language. How do I say you Urdu, Urdu? Wow. Okay. So where do you go to find these out? You see that little speaker thing? If you click on that on dictionary.com and probably Google has it, you can hear it and it's fairly natural. Names are the biggest problem we have with pronunciation. If they're not that easy to say names like Jones or Smith or Johnson, those are some easy words, but you know what? How do you say S-V-E-N? Okay. Well, it should be Sven, right? But what if it's Sven? And you have to soften your palate. Some people pronounce things differently. And again, I, I've taken a class on phonetics. And let me tell you, it is one of the toughest things to do is to practice this stuff when you don't know how where to start. Best thing is ask people. If you're not sure, wing it. Don't go, I don't know how to say this guy's name, but here I'm going to try to butcher it anyhow. Don't do that. Just practice the name. If you can do it three or four or five times, that's the way you should say it. If it's wrong, it's wrong. But it's that you're consistent in it and you don't bring the attention to, I probably blew that name. But again, you can always ask somebody on that. Ask for advice. Now, articulation is how we finish a word. Think of that. So when I'm going to go somewhere, I'm not going, I'm going somewhere. Or I'm coming over here or I'm going over there. It's going, coming. Don't drop the G's. Be careful that in speech. Now in street talk, talking to our friends, talking to our buddies, whoever, we can do that. One of the big jokes in radio school when I was there was fur. In Cleveland, in the Northeast Ohio area, we say fur a lot. The F-E-R, fur, not F-U-R, as in the little animal, little thing that you want to pet. But the fur, I'm going for some pizza. And the instructor always go, are you going to gag on that? <laughs> we would laugh. We're like, I'm going for a pizza. So that was how he corrected us. Or I'm going to do something today. To do something, not to. Again, we, if we're not corrected growing up for perfect articulation, it's not a problem because that's who you are. That's where you came from. But if you want to be more credible, fix the articulation issues, and then you can revert back to your normal stuff when you're out of there. But when you're in a job interview, depending who you're interviewing with, that articulation really shows up. Now, if the person you're interviewing with talks this way, it's okay to do that, but don't parrot them, okay? In other words, don't demean them by speaking the way they speak just because you want to match what they do. Sometimes it happens. I used to parrot people, again, because I was in radio and I used to do voice effects. That happened, but it wasn't an insult and it was so subtle that nobody really realized I was doing it. I knew I was doing it, but nobody else did. Enunciation. This is when we really get the words out of our mouth. Depending how our teeth are and our tongue and our lips, if you squeeze your cheeks really hard, just push your fingers in your, to your cheeks like I'm doing, you can hear that my voice changed. Or maybe pull on your cheeks so you can hear the difference in that. Or if you squeeze your lips together and make them really tiny, things are really hard to say. 
So practice. There are some lip exercises, tongue exercises we can do. Tongue twisters are really good. There are some, it's really embarrassing when you do this in your car and people look at you. <laughs> Stretching the jaw, working the lips in the morning. Before I do these videos, and, and I actually do my little lip exercises and face exercises and squinching because I want things to be loose. I want things to be working. If I came out and just talked to you like this, you'd be able to tell. I haven't changed my voice. I'm just pushing on my cheeks and it squeezes everything together. And it's, it's really weird when you do that. So practice that. Hear the difference and get used to your ears hearing your voice and then record it and see how silly you really sound because that's how other people hear it. Now, we never hear our own voices the same as other people do, even when we record it. It's a really weird phenomena, and I can't explain that. Science can. Vocal variety. This is where we change intonation patterns, inflections of pitch, and the duration of syllables. So this is something that you have to practice. You have to really open yourself up. If you're very introverted and afraid of talking out loud to people, this is going to be tougher. But this can really make you a dynamic public speaker and people are going to be engrossed in everything that you say. Have fun with this one. Vocal variety is fun, but don't overdo it. Now, the bodily aspects of presentation, this one's kind of hard to do on the microphone, so I'm going to demonstrate these in class. But let's go through them. So we're going to use this guy. He's pumping that fist. She's pointing that finger to make a point. Now, you can hear in my voice that something changed. I'm, man, I'm pumped into this. You're really going to get into this, says the guy. And I'm pumping my fist. You can hear the difference in my voice. Now, she's pointing a finger. So I want to make one point specifically clear. Okay, you're being more pronounced in your words. So practice gestures and voice together and see what happens. Facial expressions really matter. Now, when I say you should smile, when you speak, you don't want to be over smiley because then it comes out really weird and fake and you're going to start giggling and your cheeks are going to hurt really bad afterwards and you're going to have like the Joker smile from Batman, right? Get that smile. But facial expressions are good. We want to use our eyes. When you're concerned, what is your look? Do your eyebrows come down over your eyes? I'm really concerned about you right now. Does your, you get your eyes narrow or do your eyes open really wide? I'm really concerned about you. Well, that's a surprise. So find a mirror and practice these things. Say different emotional words. You don't even need the mirror. Just feel the muscles in your face. Very, very important in this. A lot of times I have students get up there and their face, it's too much Botox, okay? Get rid of the Botox. Stop doing the injections. I always want to say, are you doing Botox? Because there was nothing, absolutely nothing. Make the faces. It's okay to scrunch up. They're not going to stay that way permanently. Have fun with this stuff. Really squint. Now, winking and making weird faces at just one person in the room, be careful of that. Sometimes we tend to go to our go-to person because they're our supporter or our coach or something. So be careful of that because the audience really notices the direction of what we're doing and to who we're doing that with and to. Now, eye contact. This is a biggie for me. I look around the room at each of you and you right now. I'm looking at the microphone. I'm looking at you. Now, it's kind of hard to do on the microphone, but if I put my face on the video, I would actually have to stare at the camera, so I'm giving you eye contact. And it's really weird. But face-to-face, -face, we know when somebody's looking at us, and we know when somebody's not looking at us. When And I'll show you this in person again on class on Wednesday, but if I look down constantly, it's like I don't care. And you will get some instructors that don't make eye contact. Well, it might not be that they don't care. It's just that they're looking at their notes to get onto the board. Or if they're not practicing, say a new teacher, first year grad student teaching, may not look at students almost at all if they're nervous, if they're terrified of making a mistake. They're going to only look at their notes in the presentation. A good grad student will be able to look up because they know their stuff and they're really good at it. Uh, usually teachers have good eye contact. It, it's rare that a teacher does not have good eye contact. A good teacher won't look away from students. They're going to look at students. For one reason, we want to see if you're actually paying attention. We're also making that contact. We're creating that relationship with our students that makes a big difference in how you and I together learn the material. It really does matter on this. You're going to be cognitive of eye contact. 
Movement around. Now, be careful of motion. I could show you video after video after video of people doing certain motions that they didn't know they were doing until the video. And the second video, if we saw them doing their persuasive speech, it either diminished or went away completely. And it's only because we become aware of what's going on. So be careful of body motion. Now, a weird thing is, tall people above my height, about 5'8 and above, there must be a wind up there because people start swaying, especially people around six feet. I've had guys 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and they start to sway. There must be a big breezeway up there. I can't feel it, but this happens. Guys tend to rock one way and girls rock another way. And again, I'll demonstrate this. I'll show you the hip cock that people do, the crossing of the feet, the contortion of the body, how we lean on things, how people sway their shoulders or how they move their hands around in different ways. So if I'm moving my hands right now, you really can't tell as much or if I'm swaying. Now, if I sway in my chair, you know that my chair's not squeaking today, but you can kind of tell my voice might be moving on the mic and maybe not because again, it's a good mic. It picks up everything. But again, in live time, face-to-face, -face, it's going to show huge. So again, we're going to practice these things, and I want you to get used to what's happening with you. If you're not sure how you do it, again, set your phone up, set your camera up, step back so your whole body is in the view, and take a video of yourself just for 30 seconds of talking to your camera. Just talk about whatever. Just say, hey, I'm talking to my camera. I'm seeing what's going on. And watch your head. Does it tilt to one side or the other? Do your hands move too much? Do your feet shift? Do your hips cock one way, this way, that way? Do you play with your hair? Do you play with your fingernails? Do you cross your fingers? Do you make fists? Do you have open hands? Again, look at all this little stuff because the more aware of it, the faster you can correct it. Evaluation forms, we don't use these. I have it on the critique sheet. I will show you that, so let's not worry about this one, but I'm looking at a lot of different things in these. Now, this one, again, may not be you, but it might be people you're going to encounter eventually. So non-native speakers, here's what's going to happen. They are going to feel alone. That person up there is going to feel alone. Okay, I've done speeches on the impacts and challenges and the threats to international student success. And it's not physical and bodily harm. It's mental issues that go on. It's things that we can't see, things in the head that are very complicated if you don't go through it yourself. When you move out of the house for the first time, it's kind of what you might feel like. You might feel alone. And that's a good thing if you really want to get out of the house. If you're kicked out of the house, it's not such a good thing. Now, non-native speakers, it takes time for them to become patient and confident with speaking in front of people. Some people are great at it, but again, that may be the outside, the inside total liquid bowl of jello that hasn't solidified yet. Again, be patient with them too and say, hey, you know what? That was really cool what you did. I was really impressed that you did that because I wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, make them feel good afterwards too. Pronunciation is going to be a big issue. I've, I'm studying right now to teach English as a second language, and I work with 80% of the students are not from even North America. We, well, one from Canada, so she counts. But I'm working with people from all over the world, and I have for a long time. My wife is not a native English speaker. So pronunciation is a big deal. A lot of times, even my wife will ask, did I say that right, or how do you say this? Because she learned British English growing up, and it's, it's a different pronunciation. So again, they need to check on pronunciation. Don't go up to them and say, hey, you pronounced that word wrong. But say, hey, if you ever want me to you know, help you out or coach you, I'd be glad to do that. It's going to make them feel really good. You make a good connection with somebody from somewhere else. These folks are going to be able to talk with instructors about reasonable goals. They can do that with you too. If you befriend somebody from somewhere else, say you meet somebody from China, which you probably will if you go down to Kent, Maine, because we have a lot of Chinese students there. You make friends with them. They're really cool people. And they're just like us, just from another country. That's all. And speak a different language. Um, you can learn some really neat things, but reasonable goals are good. Some people are like, I need to be a perfect English speaker by the end of the semester probably not going to happen. It takes a long time. Now, the other thing is eye contact. Certain cultures, eye contact can be an aggression thing. It could also be submissive, dominant. It depends on the culture. The more you know that culture, the more it's going to help. And you'll be able to see, if you watch a couple people from a couple, the same culture, you'll start to notice possibly some similarities. I'm not saying stereotypes. I'm saying similarities. But again, do some study, do some research, you know, go to YouTube and say, hey, 
What about this culture? What's their eye contact like? I guarantee you, there are going to be a hundred videos on this stuff. You'll be able to find out. Also, these folks are going to be able to practice just like we do using audio and video recordings. It's the same thing. And they're going to go through that. And you might even offer to say, hey, can I hold your camera and you do this? I mean, just different things. Again, the biggest thing about this is be aware of yourself. Be aware of what's going on and have fun with it. Okay. Fear is normal. It's a practical and pragmatic or a realistic thing that's going to happen. If you're perceiving that you're going to be afraid, in other words, oh, I'm going to be afraid because I think I'm going to be afraid. Stop that sentence right there and say, you know what? I'm just going to go and do it and see what happens. I didn't say anything about fear. I just said, I'm going to go try it and see what happens. And you know what? Sometimes that's the best way to do it.